jump into it. Uh, I know who you are, uh, Elizabeth Clay, one of the top uh, editors in uh, jiu-jitsu going today, but why don't you uh, introduce yourself uh, for the people who might not know you? Uh, my name is Elizabeth Clay. I'm a black belt under Kishinyo and Samir Chantre. I've been training for about 11 years now, and uh, this is my full-time job. Okay, awesome. And uh, one of your most uh, recent uh, accomplishments, a uh, huge deal, was when you won the Polaris uh, Grand Prix, $20,000, right? Big, yeah. Big prize. That was recently, right? Within the past like couple months? Yeah, that was in uh, March, I believe, because it was a week before Pans, which surprisingly, even though that being in the gi, I still win. I was able to win that too, which is my first Pans. Yeah, that's uh, that's amazing to have uh, those back to back. So uh, people always ask me, well, how much prize money can you win in jujitsu? I myself have only won like uh, seven hundred dollars uh, in my, <laughs> my jujitsu career, but it's still a thrill uh, competing for money, and it must have been uh, awesome. Just talk about your experience. Um, you know, getting the call to go to Polaris and how, how it was uh, competing for that. Yeah, that was great. Um, I think that's the second time that I've competed for that much money. The last time I think was the, who's number one. I don't remember if it was 20,000, but it was around that. It was a, a decent chunk of money. So it's not like it's an all the time opportunity. So it's always great. You know, it's a, it's a pretty big chunk of money. That's what some people make in a year. So to be able to go and win that, that definitely helps a lot because as anybody knows, it, it can be hard making money in jiu-jitsu. And even if you do like make big chunks like that, sometimes you make 20,000 in one month and then the next month it's whatever you make from sponsors, which for different people kind of varies. Yeah, definitely. So for that particular tournament in Polaris, how many matches did you have? Uh, it was three matches. Three matches. Um, and yeah. I know one of them was a uh, highlight uh, toe hold uh, you got on yes. Fionn Davies. Yes. Um, I can't remember the other ones, but I'm sure they were all probably pretty tough matches. Was it 10 minute matches? Tell, uh, talk about kind of the rule set and how you, how you trained for it. Yeah, it was, I think there were 10, they were either 10 or 15. I, I can't remember right, but I think it was 10 minute matches. And then the rule set is, it's a little bit different than IBJJF, but it's pretty similar as far as it goes. Just some of what, like what the points are is a little bit different and like the, the number, but the idea is kind of the same. So basically the biggest thing that I was doing with the training for that was I would get like a fresh partner in about five minutes, about five minutes in, or I would do like five minutes with one partner, five minutes with the other. And then I do five minutes again. So I would go like 15 minute rounds just to build up the cardio and then having a fresh partner the whole time, just because if they get tired, then the, the pace isn't being pushed as much. So basically I was just doing that to get ready for the fight beforehand. And then just a lot of training with my fiance, drilling specific things, keeping the, the rule set in mind. And then obviously, you know, I, I think that a lot of people that don't compete a lot, they get used to just like normal training and you're not thinking about the points and everything. And you're like, yeah, it's fine. Not a big deal. Like they went and they swept me, whatever. I'm working my garden. I like, you can't have that, that kind of mindset when you're, when you have a big competition coming up, because if you accept it in training, you're going to start accepting it in the competition because you don't just have that quick response time that you should have. So just always keeping like the rule set in mind. And if I did end up giving up points being like, okay, well, if I do that, like in this rule set, it's all, it, this is this many points. So like working how I need to get ahead as far as that goes. And then just constantly like training with the, the rule set in mind, even though it's similar, having it even be just let's, I don't remember exactly the rule set. I, I think passing isn't as many points in the back isn't as many points. So just having that in mind um, when I'm going, because, you know, I do GF, it's three points. If you pass it's four for the back, that's a lot. Whereas in Polaris, it isn't. I believe it's only two, two points for mount and two points for the back. So that's significantly less. So if you get behind the eight ball, like you have to be thinking about that when you're competing and kind of adding up the, the points. So the same thing goes into a training. Right, right. Yeah, no. And uh, for people who wouldn't know, you're someone that has competed under a lot of different rule yeah. sets. And you compete gi, no gi, like uh, you'll you'll do anything. Uh, do yeah. you have a, <laughs> do you have a favorite rule set to compete under? Not really. I I think that's a hard one. It's a question I get asked a lot. Um, I hate when people stall and people are like, "Well, this rule set's better for not stalling. This rule set's better for that." But the thing is, if somebody wants to stall, there's always a way to to play the rules. You you'll have that in any sport. There's no way to like get rid of of stalling or people that that kind of play around that play to the points because you know, that that could be just somebody's game. And if somebody's going to play that, 
they're going to play like that regardless. If you have EBI, for example, if people want to stall, they'll stall the entire time until they hit overtime and they literally just practice fast escapes. Mm-hmm. IBJJF, 50-50. You'll get people that'll sit there and they'll wait until the last 10 seconds. They'll sweep come and just stay right there and stall out to it. So I don't, I think each rule set, you have to adjust a little bit to deal with um, the stalling aspect of it, but every rule set's going to be like that. So it's nice that there's different rule sets though, because it, you're not getting stuck in the same thing over and over and over again, necessarily, you at least get to change it up a little bit. Um, so I don't really have a favorite rule set. And then same thing, gi or no gi, it kind of depends on my mood. Like sometimes I want to be doing gi and sometimes I want to be doing no gi, um, and then other times I'll have it. It's like no gi season. I'm like, I don't want to do it. And then, you know, a month in, then I'm good again. Has that changed for you over time? Like, did you start out as a more gi or no gi person? I definitely, I started out way more gi. Like I hated no gi. I oh, didn't really? start, tra- hated no gi. I <laughs> didn't start training uh, no gi seriously until I was like almost four years into training, I think. Okay. It, maybe it was, I think it was about, four or five years into training because I only started taking nogi like seriously like actually training nogi not like it doesn't count when you go and you roll nogi once a week like that's not training nogi you're doing gi without the gi on uh but like I didn't start like actually training nogi until probably like six or seven months before that first trials I did in 2017 oh wow okay yeah and that and you won that trials yeah I did Right. And then you got injured and then couldn't mm-hmm. to the ADCC, right? Yeah. I, I messed up my knee pretty bad right before. And I kept trying to like train through it. I probably heard it about a month before. And then I kept trying to train for like two weeks and my knee was like popping in and out. I would be in lockdown and my knees like popping out to the side. Um, so yeah, I ended up getting hurt that one and, and not being able to go compete that ADCC. Oh, okay. Okay. So um, I, I'm not sure exactly when I kind of heard about you or learned about you, but I remember I, over COVID in 2020, I did a mm-hmm. just like breakdown video when you were on one of the who's number one events, like thinking Louisa, uh, yeah. Ariel, you got her with a, with a leg lock. And I remember I just mm-hmm. did like a video for my students. Um, and that was uh, pretty cool. And then you competed a lot, like through 2020, 2021. And then you competed uh, at that last uh, ADCC, which was the biggest event that there's ever been so far in uh, yeah. the history of uh, jiu-jitsu. Talk about that. That must have been a pretty cool experience. That was It was awesome. The, the event was huge, being at something like that. Um, I don't think you can really compare it to any anything else, just because they only have, you, you only have like the elite level going there. I had some people that were trying to like compare the IBJF worlds to ADCC and it's not the same thing. ADCC is only once every two years. So obviously you're going to get a bigger turnout. Not only do you only have black belts, it's not only black belts, but it's only like that top level. It's not even everyone at the top level. There's only 16 guys per bracket and there's only 16 women in the entire competition because they only have eight women per bracket. Um, So I feel like you can't, it's apples and oranges there. But being at something that big was definitely, it was cool to, you know, go and see that. And obviously, like, I didn't have the result there that I wanted. I feel like I could have performed better. But there was a lot of things, like, I'm significantly smaller competing in that division where I go. Um, But being at something that big and something that's just centered around the top-level athletes is definitely cool. And I feel like it's, it's, I don't want to say once-in-a-lifetime experience because, you know, hopefully it won't be my only time competing there. Um, but I feel like that's one of the only ways to describe it as like a once in a lifetime kind of experience getting to be there and seeing that and then you know, all the fans there and everything like that. And it's definitely a, a really cool thing to get to go and compete at. Yeah, I can imagine like you're really, uh, you're a superstar for, for yeah. the whole weekend, right? Like they just, uh, yeah. pride lady introductions and like so many people watching the matches and I'm sure it was just, uh, yeah, that was just so cool. So there was recently, I know, uh, there was changes announced for the next ADCC. Mm-hmm. There's going to be an extra women's division. So will that, uh, benefit you that, that change, will that affect you? Oh, definitely. So they added in uh, 55 kilo, which is about 121, And then they moved the 60 kilo to 65, which for me is perfect. Cause I walk around like 66, 67 kilos. So with the 65 kilo, I think if you convert it to pounds is like 143. 
and I walk around like 148. So for me, I lose like five pounds. I'm in it. It's perfect. The 60 kilo, which is 132 is just too light for me to make. So I ended up having to fight the over one. So that new weight class for me, the, the 65 kilo is it's perfect. I'll be able to go. People will be closer to my size. You're still going to have some girls that are getting cut way down. So they'd be a little bit bigger, but you're making the weight. So regardless, you're going to lose some strength. It doesn't really matter to me. Um, it'll be much better. I'll actually be competing against people that are in my weight class instead of it basically being an open weight without getting paid for being an open weight. Um, and I'm, ex- I'm really excited to see who's going to cut down where, cause it'll be interesting. Cause I don't think they're gonna, definitely going to be a couple girls from 60 that are going to cut down to 55, but I'm curious to see who's going to cut down to 60 to 55 and who's going to go up to the 65. Yeah. It's just awesome that there'll be just more, uh, just another division and more. Yeah. More it's like- great going to be uh that's going to be awesome so uh technique wise some people may not know but uh you're someone that i would see as like a a leg lock specialist i know you are much more than that (laughs) but uh you know most of what i watch from your highlights a lot of toe holds heel hooks um talk about that because i'm someone i'm a black belt and i try to get my students comfortable with leg locks pretty early is most of the classes that I teach are no gi, and I talk about how important it is the uh, no gi uh, leg locks, how important it is in the game. What are some tips that you would give people for like getting started with leg locks? Do you have any advice? Uh, I think one of the biggest things, and this is going to be kind of like almost not working it, is to not get tunnel vision. I think a lot of people get you get very, very, very tunnel vision on working it, and that's something you need to part of the leg locks that make it what it is now versus what it was 20 years ago is 20 years ago. If you fell on a leg lock, if you didn't get it, you lost everything. Yeah. So it's also working, not only the leg lock itself and the control, you also need the control of it. Not just, you don't want just the finish. If you can't control the position, you don't have it. It's like, you shouldn't just jump on an arm bar. And if they don't tap in two seconds, you lost the entire arm bar, right? You want the control and it's the exact same thing in the leg locks is you want that control first before you even go for the finish. If you don't have the control, you don't have the submission. I don't care if you're getting the tap or not, you're not doing everything correctly. So you need to one, have the control of the position, then work the finish, but also you want to work your transitions out of it. Like using your, your leg locks to set up a pass or working to take the back or something like that. So that you're not just getting stuck on the legs. And I think you see that a lot, especially like purple Brown, um, they get stuck and they just sit there and they've lost the entire position. There's no control. And it's not like they're hanging on to it and like working their hips back up. They're just hanging on for dear life. And to me, honestly, it kind of looks like the white belt, you know, when their hips are like, they've completely lost the elbow, but they're just like holding on and trying to do it. <laughs> yeah. And you're like looking at them. You're like, what's you've lost everything. What's going on? And they're not trying to pull the elbow back. They're just hanging on basically the forearm. And that's basically the same thing you'll get kind of with, with the leg locks. I feel like when you get like purple and brown belts, when they first start working on it, they're like hanging on the end of the leg. They don't have the knee line. They have no control of the position. So it's kind of just that same approach you take, right? When you're like a white belt starting at something, don't get tunnel vision on it, focusing on the control and then the transitions out of it, just like anything else. It's not, it's really not all that different than any other submission. I think the problem is that people think of it very much as like jujitsu leg locks and it's not, it all goes together and you need to look at it all the same way. Yeah, no, I think that uh, that's great advice. So it was something that you always uh, played with in your training, like from white belt, blue belt. When would you say you started kind of uh, learning leg locks? Uh, I probably started learning them when I started. So I started competing with the adults when I was only 14, but I didn't start, but I was competing with white belts for probably about that first six, seven months. So when I started competing in the advanced division and of course, advanced division is in Alaska, it's a tiny competition, but the rule set opened up. We'll go with that. When my rule set opened up where, where I was competing, then I started playing with them. So I was still pretty young. I was probably like 14, 15, like a, I think I was like a yellow belt or something. Um, but it's because I was competing in that rule set. If I wasn't competing in that rule set, then I probably wouldn't have started messing with them yet. But because I was competing at that rule set, obviously I needed to have an idea of what was going on, even if I wasn't like attacking them. Um, but yeah, so I was pretty young starting it, but my, I think my biggest thing is like, do it when you're starting to compete at that rule set or like right before, like for a lot of the adults. I'll start attacking their feet when they hit 
purple. And obviously that's different, like straight ankle locks, that's legal white belts, start doing it as white belt. Great. Um, but like everything else, like toe holds, knee bars, everything like that, I'll start doing it when they're probably about like purple. And I'll be like, and obviously like talk to them. Some people have knee problems. Some people just don't want to do that. Some people don't compete. Um, so I think it's a little bit different for every person. Depends if you started as a kid or an adult, because that's going to kind of depend on your rule set. If you started as a kid, you might be competing in the adult division and, or in the advanced division when you're still like, technically you're like a blue belt or not even that. That's a little bit different than like an adult that started later doing it. So I think it, it varies at like what, where you're competing and that type of thing. Right. Yeah, no, no, I think that's, that's, yeah, really good. So, uh, you mentioned, uh, you started young, talk a little bit more about the age that you started. Um, you mentioned Alaska. I think that's where you grew up. Talk a little bit about the age you started, what got you interested in jujitsu and a little bit more about where, where you grew up at. So I did, gym, so this is going to have to start before I did gymnastics on and off for about 10 years. I started when I was, I was really small. I was like 18 months old. Um, all my older siblings were elite gymnasts. I never made it that far because, again, I was on and off. If you know anything about gymnastics, it's incredibly expensive. Um, so because of that, I was kind of in and out because having, you know, five kids in there is extremely expensive. So I was doing gymnastics in Alaska, and I just wasn't getting in the hours. And I was probably about 10 or 11 at this point. And in my head, even as, like, a 10 or 11-year-old, I was like, obviously, at this point, like, I'm not going to the Olympics. I'm not that delusional. But I was like, maybe I could go to college um, with it. And I just wasn't getting enough hours to even make it at that point. And I was like, this is stupid. I I'm done. So I quit doing gymnastics and I was like, hey, I need another sport. And I was looking at like diving, uh, ice skating, something that was more similar to gymnastics. And I ended up one of my older brothers wanted a new MMA. And I just kind of was like, yeah, like I'll go try like the jujitsu part of it. And at that point, like I had no idea what jujitsu was. I was like, it's like karate, right? that whole thing so I go in and obviously it's nothing like that and I try like one class I'm in one class in and I told my mom I was like this is it this is what I'm doing she was like okay like you want to do it and I was like no like I, I'm gonna I'm gonna be the best this is what I'm doing one class in and of course everyone's like yeah 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 you're crazy whatever but that was just my personality like I knew right away if I liked something or if I didn't and if I was going to do something, I was going to be the best. Like, I wasn't just going to do something for, for fun. Like, that never made sense to me. I was like, if I want to go do something for fun and go play on the playground. I'm not going to do a sport for just for fun. So I think my first competition, I because it, this is in Alaska, it's small. They only have two competitions a year. And I think I started in, like, June. And usually they had one. They had a no-gi competition at the end of the year. And then in March, they usually had a gi competition. But the people that ran the competition, they were having a baby that year. So they canceled that competition. And I remember just being upset. Like I wanted to compete. I'd only been training probably like four months at that point, but I wanted to compete. So I waited until like the one in that was in March. And so I'd probably been training like eight months at that point. And I remember I got second and I was just so mad. <laughs> and which is hilarious looking back now, because like they didn't separate the divisions. I was 12, but because I turned 13 that year, they put me with like 13 to 14 year olds. I was like 90 pounds when I started training. So I wasn't very big. They had no, like no weight divisions, no belt. It was just age. So I remember who I, the kid I fought in the finals was giant. Like kid had to be like one, like 150 at least was way taller than me. It was like a 14 year old boy it was like a green belt. And I'm like, I was a white belt. I don't even think I had any stripes. And I was just mad that I lost. And it wasn't even like, I, I don't know how I remember that. Like, it wasn't even a bad loss, but I just remember being so angry that I lost and I'm going back to training, went back <laughs> to the gym and, and it just kept going from there. I think I did. I don't think that year, maybe I did the U S open that year back when like U S open was like a big thing, flew to California from Alaska, yeah. did the U S open. I think, I think I won that year. I don't even remember. Um, but like right away was competing and, and just, just training as much as I could. I would literally get up and go with my siblings to college because I was homeschooled. I would get up with them, go to college so that I could train on Tuesdays because my mom wasn't driving into town on Tuesdays because she already went four days a week. But I wasn't going to just train four days a week because if I just trained four days a week, basically in my head, I suck and I was just going to lose everything anyway. So I would get up like six in the morning, take my school with me 
do my school. I would walk like, it probably wasn't a mile, like half a mile. I would walk like half a mile to go train and training wasn't even until like four. So I was there all day just to be able to train like an extra, an extra day a week. Wow. So, and now where do you live and train now? So I'm in Arizona now, um, training with Kishino. So under okay. Aries and I've been Aries since 2016. So it's been a while. Okay. Okay. Awesome. Awesome. So yeah, that's, that's quite a while that you've been there. Yeah. So do you have like a kind of a proudest moment of your career so far? Um, that's hard. There's so, I feel like there's so many, um, I still think I would pull that ADCC trials in 2017 as much as like I've won other things since then. And like, there are a lot of big moments that went into it. I think that one was the biggest because not only in, in my head, like doing that competition, if I was lucky, I was just going to place. Um, I had just switched gyms maybe like eight months before that I was at a new gym. Um, I would cut a bunch of weight to get there. And I had had coaches previously tell me like, you shouldn't do the trials until you're at least like 18, 19 in a purple belt. Cause you're just going to get hurt. There's no reason it's a waste of your time, money, blah, blah, blah. So I was 16 going in a blue belt. Um, and just everything that went into it, like the dieting that went into it, the, the cutting weight the training, the everything. I, I think that's probably one of like the biggest moments because not only was I like really young winning it, but there was so much that went into it that people didn't see months and months of dieting and getting up early and running and training and at an extra training. Um, and I, you know, while there's other ones like winning pants was a big thing, Polaris, Nogi worlds, all of those were all like big things. I think that that one was still like the proudest moment just because of everything that went into it behind the scenes that people didn't see. Yeah, no, that that's a incredible uh, accomplishment. So do you teach any classes? Uh, not currently. Uh, I used to teach. So I taught for a couple of years, probably from like blue belt, blue belt until black belt. When I was over in California, I was still teaching. But since I moved here to Arizona about a year and a half ago, I'll teach occasionally some of the schools that have me over about like twice a month or so, but it's more so like guest instructor, more workshop types things, um, which I don't mind because I just get to focus more on my training because it can be really hard balancing teaching and training and, and everything like that. Yeah, no, and especially where you're so active at competing, it'd be hard to like probably keep a, a dedicated schedule to like de- teach yeah. how classes. So, I mean, you have, uh, you, yeah, you've competed and won so much. Do you have like a kind of a top three favorite matches that you've had? I know it's probably hard to narrow it down, but what, what kind of comes I to mind? Some of your favorite matches? I really don't think I have any, honestly. No. No. I, I feel like that's not something that usually I, that I have, because it's always, I'm always looking for the next match and, and the next thing. So that's kind of hard. I don't think I have any. Okay. That's fair. Um, do you have kind of a, a dream opponent for yourself or if not for yourself, a matchup that you'd like to see two other people? I'm going to be, I don't even watch jujitsu that much. So I don't really have um, a lot, obviously any of the girls that are, you know, winning, in my division would always be good, but it's, I think most of them are just rematches matches that I've had in the past matches that are going to happen again. Cause we're just all in the same division. Yeah. And you've competed pretty much against all of the top uh, competitors, right? Like uh, Theon, yeah. Gabby Garcia, you competed against her, right? Via Mesquita, yep. like pretty much yeah. uh, all, all like the top ones that I can, uh, that I can think of. Yeah, pretty much, <laughs> which is crazy. Cause it's all across different weight classes. Yeah. And you're still like pretty early in your like black belt career, right? Like when did you get your black belt? Yeah, I'm coming. uh, November will be three years for me. (laughs) Three years. Wow. Yeah. yeah, Quite quite a few. uh, Yeah. Quite a few matches and stuff under your belt. Mm -hmm. So is your your next goal is probably ADCC, right? It's probably a year away now. Yeah. ADCC and then Gi World still because I still don't have Gi World. Um, I've gotten silver at Gi World, but I haven't won it yet. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's that, that in ADCC. Nice. Um, do you have tournament advice for people that are kind of just getting started? Like I have quite a few students who are thinking about doing their first tournament. They're maybe nine, nine months to a year into their training, quite nervous, you know, 
do you have any advice for people when they're going out for their first match? I think the, the biggest thing, the nerves are normal. I think a lot of people, they first get the nerves and they're like, it's because I haven't competed before that. Like I get the nerves, the nerves are normal. The nerves aren't a bad thing. I think that's one of the, the hardest things to learn is that it, it, they're not a bad thing. It's you feel nervous because you care. You think about anything, you know, getting on stage in front of people, stuff like that. Usually you get nerves. It doesn't mean it's a bad thing. Um, so basically just not fighting them, go out there and not treat it necessarily like training, but that's why, that's why you should treat training like a competition and the fact of how you view the rule set and not giving up the points and everything like that. So that then when you go to compete, you can just kind of treat it like training. Like you've already been training, not to give up the points. You've already been training with the rule set in mind. You've already been training with the points in mind. So that then when you go out there, it's not something completely different. You're doing what you do in training. You're just doing it on a different set of mats. And there's a referee there and there's some people watching. But let's be real. Most of the people are probably watching other matches too, or they're just standing there because that's what people do at most competitions. They just kind of stand there unless it's somebody that they know competing. Um, So just go out there and, and treat it kind of like training. And if you're wanting to get good at competing, you just have to compete a lot. Yeah. Being good at jujitsu is one thing, being good at competing is another, and you need both to win. Totally. And I always say you really need to know the rules. Like I always make sure to read the rules of whatever competition it is to my students. If they're thinking about yeah. doing, there's a lot of people don't do that. They don't read the rules. They just go to the tournament and think they'll just do whatever it is that they do in training. And they don't, they're not aware that's like maybe doing illegal moves or, or mm-hmm. they think points when they actually didn't or yep. stuff like that happens. So I think it's really important to read the rules. Every tournament usually yes. lists on, a, on their own page, but I think that's uh, really important. Yeah, the rules are, knowing the rules are extremely important. And even when they're similar, little differences make make everything. You, ha- you have to know all of them. And obviously it matters more at the higher levels, um, the more you climb up, but the rules still matter in every single competition at any level. Totally. And like, I mean, you, you do a lot of IBJJF. IBJJF has a ton of rules, like especially yeah. for the competitions I find. ADCC still does have quite a few uh, rules that you would need to know uh, if you were competing in mm-hmm. it. But you also do like uh, submission only and like yeah. no time limit and stuff too. Do you, you really enjoy stuff like that? I like all of it. Um, I, I think the only thing with, no time limit stuff like that doesn't bother me. I think it makes it harder when it's submission only when they don't have like a straightforward criteria. And I think you run into that a lot with some of the submission only is they're like, well, it's kind of like whoever's controlling the fight more. And it's like, but how are you looking at that? How are you determining it? Um, so I think those can be a little bit harder to know when you're winning and when you're not. Um, for that reason, funny enough, I used to like always love submission only. I've almost kind of gotten a little bit away from them for the reason that it can be hard knowing like who's the judge. What do they think? Do they, per- do they prefer people playing on bottom? Do they prefer passers? And you'll get some people, not that they're necessarily, they're not biased, but how they look at it is, is a little bit different and you don't necessarily have the set of criteria that they're looking for in front of you, uh, which can make it a little bit harder when it comes to knowing how to play the rules and, and what you should be doing. Yeah, no, I think that's, uh, yeah, that's really good. So you're someone you train a lot, you do a lot of hard competition training when it comes to like recovery wise, is there anything that you focus on now? Do you like stretch a lot? Are you like one of those like ice bath people? Like is, what do you do for recovery? Um, honestly, I'm probably one of the worst when it comes to doing like recovery for myself. I'm not going to lie. I don't stretch at all. Um, which I think surprises a lot of people considering how flexible I am. But like, I don't stretch at all. Uh, if my body is really sore, we have a recovery place. that's literally like right next to my apartment and I'm the giant baby that I'll just do like the compression and the sauna. If my body's really bad, then I'll do the, the, the cold plunge. Um, but if you've ever done a cold plunge, you know how much they suck. But at the same time, how much they suck is really like, I don't think there's anything. If your body's really hurting. I don't think there's anything that's as good for recovery as a cold plunge. So if it's like right before a competition, if my body's really been bugging me, I'll go through, I'll do like the compression, I'll do the sauna. And then if I really need it, then I jump in the cold plunge for not too long, like two, three minutes, maybe, but it it does make a difference. 
yeah no that would be great for like after a tournament or like real hard yeah like sessions and stuff yeah i mean i'm uh 33 i'm getting old now i started when i was that <laughs> years old so i find like i tell my students to try to stretch you know as much as possible yeah stay mobile like i've read uh, a book recently and it was talking about you want to stay mobile for life basically like always yeah. just just keep moving mobility is so important and i think that's uh re really important for uh for jiu-jitsu whether you're like uh, fle flexible or not you want to make sure that you, you stay mobile definitely and, yeah yeah um awesome yeah so um tech uh technique wise like you uh, like i said you're leg lock person but you also do a lot of gi and stuff um are you someone that likes like the lapel guards and all that type of stuff like i guess give, give me uh give me some jujitsu stuff that you don't like like what's a move or two that you're like ah, I, I i don't care for that i don't want that <laughs> oh um i hate butterfly guard i hate oh, really? butterfly guard it, it's a it's a i hate it for me personally it's a great guard but i've never been good at it like i might occasionally hit like a like a butterfly sweep but it's not normal. It's like once a year, once every six months. And when I do, it's just because I landed right in the perfect position. And I was like, oh, this sweeps right here. Um, it's something I'm not like, I'm, I'm not good at it. You would think that like looking at my game, it should fit perfectly, especially in like Nogi. And it was funny because uh, Flow Grappling put out like a, a video one time or, or an article and they're like, oh, Elizabeth Clay plays butterfly guard. And I was like, no, if you look, my feet are on the knees. They're not inside because I can't play butterfly guard. I'm not <laughs> good at it. I never have been. I even like, I remember for a long time, I took like privates to be good at it and everything like that. Not good at it. Not my thing. Um, and other things probably like, I would say Baron Bolos aren't like my top thing, but I'll still do them in competition. Like I, I think I've hit one in competition. And that was one thing that like, I was like working and I was like, people say, I only do no gi, right? I'm going to do the most gi thing you can do. I'm going to do a baron bowl and take the back. Yeah, no, I love it. I, uh, I'm a baron bolo guy because when I was a blue belt, that was like the half, half of Mendez was like, that was mm -hmm. his name and Cobrinha. It was such a popular technique at the time that we're like, yeah. everybody was doing it. But yeah, I always find, I guess it kind of depends on the era that you kind of come up and, and you kind of train. Like I'm someone too, that I, I definitely thought the lapel guards and stuff were cool, but now I'm like, I just see it as kind of like more kind of like a lot of people just use it to stall. And just like you said, mm -hmm. like stalling in competition, yeah. like a lot of people use it for that. Some people don't, but um, some people yeah. are really good at it, but it's definitely hard. Yeah. Yeah. It's really hard. And, um, I've, I'm someone that has transitioned to more no gi. and I was way more of a gi person. Like, honestly, like anything that I've won has really been. Uh, in the gi, I got a uh, silver from Blue Belt Worlds and some other like IBJJF stuff in the gi. But I've still like just over time felt like, well, I don't know. Every, all the events are no gi. Like anytime who's number one is on, it's always mm -hmm. 90, 99 percent no gi matches. And it just seems like that's kind of the kind of where jujitsu is going. Would you agree? I don't think necessarily, because the thing is, while a lot of those might be the events that are being put on. If you look at who they're pulling, a lot of times they won B things though. So sure. I, I, this is kind of a thing that you, that people like to argue with the IBGF and while I have my gripe about some of the stuff that they do and how they run. If you really look at who books more seminars, who books more things that you are not anomalies like and stuff like that. We're not talking about, about those. If you look at the overall, the normal, most of them have either one or podium at gi things like at least in like major gi things gi worlds pans who does the most seminars and are on those events even when they're no gi events normally they've won and done well in the gi even more so than than no gi and those are the ones that get on so i think it's kind of it's interesting looking at it but a lot of times like if you're looking for it i would say gi worlds is harder than no gi worlds if you're looking at it so if you want to go who's winning in the gi even if it's for no gi you look at those when you're I feel like when you're booking seminars or, or, or flights. Uh, so maybe the like events themselves, like the invitational type events are more no gi, but I feel like they still pull people that are competing regularly in the gi to do those. Oh yeah, no, I, I would agree hundred percent. It's all like really high level gi competitors. And I wish they would have more gi matches. Like I think yeah. 
had one or has one coming up, but they usually have, they usually just stack it more on like the no gi um, mm -hmm. side of things. Um, but is, is that something you'll continue to do? You'll continue to compete both in gi and no gi? Oh, for sure. I definitely, I wouldn't want to give up either one. I enjoy doing both. And also maybe it's just my ego, but there's something about, I hate when people are just like, oh, you're just a gi player, just a no gi player. So maybe it's totally my ego that I'm like, oh, I'm just going to be good at both. Um, <laughs> and, you know, obviously like it's a constant work in progress, but I, I really, I don't think I could give up one or the other. Yeah, no, and it's, it is, uh, it's great to have, have the variety and they, they are both so different. And um, yeah. Yeah. Like you said, you started in the gi, then kind of like no gi, and now you're pretty much just good with both. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So that's awesome. So, okay. So you're got ADCC coming up. Uh, that'd be next year. And the gi yep. worlds that probably be like in June or something. Mm -hmm. And May there'll be June. probably like local tournaments and, and anything you have like, like on the horizon coming up in the next couple months. Uh, coming up, I'll probably going to do the AJP that's in Miami, the Grand Slam that's there. That's in September. Possibly no gi pans, um, but I have some stuff that might be conflicting, so I'll have to wait and see if I'm able to. Um, just the normal no, kind of no gi competitions that are coming up aside from those two. Okay, awesome. Yeah. And, you know, I would say nowadays in jiu-jitsu, there's definitely uh, more women that are getting involved in the sport, yeah. you know, like they added that new division for in ADCC. That's, that's huge. Um, and I think the, there's more people doing it, but what, what would you say, uh, people can do gyms can do to kind of encourage, uh, more women to, to get involved in with jujitsu training? Honestly, I think for the most part, gyms are, are doing a great job. Um, I think one thing, and, and maybe I'll have people that disagree with me on this and that's okay. I think people need to be careful about doing too much. That's necessarily a hundred percent geared towards women, because I feel like the issue you get is you get women that are very not coddled necessarily, but that's the best word I can think to do it where they have so much stuff that's purely geared towards women, um, women's only classes, women's only open mats, women's only this. And while it, it is good to have a place where they can train with other women, um, maybe it's just because I grew up with brothers. And so I always had like the opposite effect that I was like, you're not allowed to do anything that's boys only. So I kind of ran into thing that I was like, well, I don't like girls only stuff. Like how would I feel if they did that to me? Um, and so maybe I have a, a unique perspective on it because I grew up with so many brothers. But I think you need to be careful when gyms start doing too much, like women's only classes, women's only this. I think it's one thing to do like an entry thing that's women's only, like, maybe you have a class once or twice a week and for the first month, if they're not comfortable, they just do that. But I feel like you need to get them acclimated into the co-ed classes and having that um, and not keeping them kind of like, I feel like you almost see it. Sometimes you'll get in classes and I understand that for most women, it's a, it's a comfort thing, but I really do feel like it limits the growth. You'll kind of see it where like all the women are in one corner, even during the co-ed classes when they're rolling, it's all the girls together. It's always them drilling together and I get it like you're gonna have your like your favorite person to drill with or whatever and that's okay but I I think one thing that and this is more so for the growth of the women that are already in the gym than necessarily bringing in new women but I think seeing that helps other women stay is getting them where they're acclimated to everything else and split up the training instead of like you look over and I don't know if this is at every gym but I see this a lot you'll look over in the corner and there's one corner where all the girls are and it's only girls with girls. Um, and I don't, I, I feel like that really puts a limit on how much that they're able to really grow with their own personal jujitsu. Yeah, no, I, I would agree with what you said there. And I'm someone, I have uh, my own gym, a smaller gym that I run out of my, uh, my house and it's like something I've kind of thought about, well, should I have offer women's only classes? I thought about maybe having like a month or a six week kind of thing where I have one uh, class a week, women's only. But like you said, I would like to have uh, like more co-ed, the all the classes that I teach now are just co-ed classes. So yeah, that's something I've always been like thinking about, like maybe I should just do it as like, you know, like a, as a trial kind of program. Yeah. I would like to have, um, more women involved in the sports, but yeah, that's just something that I've, uh, I've kind of been thinking about. So I thought you'd be a good person to ask. 
Yeah, I definitely think I have a, a different perspective than most. I think a, a lot of women you talk like they really like the women's only thing. Uh, and I, I think it can have like a place, but I think it gets, I feel like a lot of women use it and they kind of get like pigeonholed and they just stay there. And they, they never like learn to use that as like just a stepping stone if they need it. Um, and said so they just kind of stay there forever. And, and I, I don't think that's good for, for their jujitsu. Yeah, no, I, I would, uh, I would agree. I would agree with that for sure. Yeah. So, um, yeah, so I'm just trying to make sure we're good for time here. So how many, uh, question that I had people want to ask, how many days a week do you train? You train a lot, five, six, seven days a week. How many days a week do you train? Uh, so I train five days a week right now. If they had an open mat on the weekends, then I would definitely train like six days a week. Um, but on those two days that I have off, which are Saturday and Sunday, I still go lift on Saturday. And then Sunday kind of depends. Sunday's kind of like my day that I'll like today. I went and I did so many loads of laundry. There's so much laundry. <laughs> <laughs> five loads and over half of them are just geese, not even like no geese stuff that nothing, just geese, half of them. Um, so Sundays are usually spent literally like, so I go, I put on the laundry. I went to the pool, laid around, like played in the pool for a little bit, go back, switch the laundry. Um, so these are, so Sundays are usually kind of like a lazier day. And then Saturdays I'll lift and more of kind of like an act, active kind of more recovery. Um, but I don't usually actually train jujitsu on Saturdays and then the rest of the days of the week I train at least I train twice a day and then I lift two of those so I, I lift three days a week and then I train five days a week twice a day oh nice yeah no you definitely need some some good uh, rest time with yeah. that training schedule that busy do you um like I've uh, a couple times in my classes recently we've been talking about like sleep and stuff. Are you someone that has like, uh, you go to bed at like the same time every night, you have an easy time going to sleep. I find a lot of people tell me they have a real hard time struggling to get to sleep. They're like, I want to come to the morning class, but I just can't, I uh, can't get to bed on bed on time. Uh, talk about that. Do you have any thoughts on that? I don't train early. I can't do early morning trainings. Cause I feel like no matter what, unless it's like right for worlds and maybe we'll do like an early morning, but even that that's only like the earliest is 8 a.m. tops. Um, but usually like during the week, one of the, one of my morning training starts at 9 30 and then the other one's 11. So I literally wake up like half an hour to an hour before maybe have my coffee, sit around. And then like, I go train because I don't, I can't sleep early. I've never been able to like, even if I wake up super early, I don't sleep well. If I go to bed early, I'm someone that like, me going to bed early is going to bed at midnight that's <laughs> yeah. pretty normal for me um but I definitely like I, I sleep in until I have to wake up for training no I'm uh, that's cool I'm the total opposite uh but I have an eight <laughs> old son and uh and I'm old now so I, <laughs> I used to sleep, but now I, I really value my uh, sleep and I find it does help with my I teach like six days a week so I find I gotta try to keep up with my my sleep and so I'm, I'm still yeah. still feeling good and stuff yeah yeah no it's uh cool interesting to talk about um yeah so just kind of wrapping up I just got like five or six just kind of random yeah. questions to kind of learn more about your personality we'll just finish with that so um give us a few of your favorite um uh, movies are you a movie person that's hard I'm the type of person I only I watch like a movie once um but I will because my fiance will make fun of me for this. I watch kids movies all the time. Like I watch every every type of movie, but I'll rewatch like kids movies. Like I think last night we literally watched Turbo because okay. he was looking for another movie to put on. And he's like, oh, just put this one on. We say to watch that movie instead of putting a different one on. <laughs> uh, like those are the only types of movies that I feel like I actually like rewatch or like old TV shows like Friends or what was I watching the other day? Full House. Nice. Old school. <laughs> so would you have a favorite martial arts movie? I don't. Honestly, I don't watch that many martial arts movies. I watch more, oddly enough, I watch more gymnastics movies. Oh, okay. Not so much anymore, but I used to. 
Okay. Um, did you have someone when you were training that you kind of looked up to or admired, like a high level competitor or someone that you kind of wanted to model yourself over? Did you have anyone like that when you were starting out in jujitsu or starting to compete? Uh, yeah, actually, when I was younger, it was uh, Michelle Nicolini. Okay, yeah, and she's amazing. Talk a little bit about her. Yeah, she me. is. Uh, yeah, Michelle Nicolini, I think she's won Worlds like eight times or some, something like that as a black belt. Uh, but I remember I was, I think I was about 14 when I first met her. She came up to Alaska to do a seminar, and I was able to do a private with her. Um, and honest, I wouldn't say we have similar games at all. But she was definitely somebody that like I looked up to and being able to like ask her questions more so like in the private. I don't even we hardly went over any actual moves, um, but just went over like mindset and like how it is in the, in the sport, especially at that point in time, like making a living in the sport was almost impossible, especially being a, a, a girl in the sport was even more so like I remember it was one of those things like being asked about it, like, yeah, yeah I'm going to do this as a living, like getting laughed at specifically because I was a girl um so being able to like ask her questions about that um and just stuff like that was really cool and she, she's just super nice she's a really nice person yeah Michelle Nicolini she's amazing and she's had like a number of MMA fights too yeah yeah she's done yeah, it she, all. she took a run at that yeah yeah um okay here's a question for you if tomorrow you could either compete at Gi Worlds or ADCC. Say they were both on the same day. You can only do one. Which one you do? Oh man, that's. I feel like you have to look at the fact ADCC pays more than Worlds does, and like at the really, end of the yeah. day, <laughs> and it's only once every two years. Like I could do yeah. Gi Worlds next year, and I can't do ADCC next year because it's only every two years. Man, that's that's a hard one, but probably ADCC. But I don't know. That would be hard. Yeah, no, I know you want both bad. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that would be tough. Yeah. Um, um, what about uh, what do you usually eat for breakfast? I skip breakfast most of the time. What's but if the I if I have breakfast, I'll do a smoothie. Okay. If I end up having breakfast. Okay. Yeah. No, I do a lot of smoothies too. My son, uh, he loves them. He goes crazy. For yeah. Them. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, uh, well, yeah, no, that's, uh, I mean, that's pretty much all the, the questions that I had. I think we covered uh, a lot of cool stuff. Your current, uh, kind of what's going on with you competition wise, your history of when you started training in Alaska is really cool. Um, yeah, that's, uh, it's just really awesome to, to connect and, and chat with you. And, um, yeah, it was a really cool experience for me getting to, uh, to talk to you and interview you. Yeah, it was good. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, awesome. Well, uh, well, thanks a lot, uh, Elizabeth. I'm sure people will, uh, will enjoy this and, and hear it from, from you and hearing your perspective, uh, kind of on jujitsu and, uh, best of luck uh, in the future with, with all your competitions. Uh, I'll, I'll be watching and I'm sure everybody else else will obviously, but, uh, but yeah, thanks. Thanks for taking the time to do this and, uh, best of luck in the future and uh, have a great night. Of course. Thank you so much.